Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Brad Bollinger. I'm the publisher of the North Bay Business Journal, and welcome to the second installment of our Construction Industry Conference. This is our 20th annual conference, Building the North Bay. We decided way back in March when the pandemic started that we were going to continue to bring people together and provide information uh, indus by industry, continue to do our awards programs because we thought it was important to continue to fulfill our mission. And that's why we're here this morning. And thank you for, for being with us on our, on our Zoom platform. As our speakers that you will hear from, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them in a second. Uh, we are at a moment, it seems like I've been around here three plus decades and we're at a moment where uh, multi-story uh, housing is looks like it's finally going to come to our urban areas. And then also there's some very exciting affordable housing projects that you'll hear about uh, this morning. Uh, we're here this morning that's free to attendees because of our sponsors, uh, which uh, are sponsoring both of these sessions. The first one being back in July, our underwriter, uh, Gelati Construction Company, our major sponsors, uh, George Peterson Insurance Agency, Oles Morrison Law Firm, Wright Contracting, and our corporate sponsors, Marin Builders Association, Mid-State uh, Construction, Norby Construction, the North Coast Builders Exchange. And out there, I want to, uh, again, thank Keith Woods for uh, all the input he has into our programs over the years. Every year, we always seek his counsel. So uh, the way this will go this morning is we have three speakers for you. They will be speaking individually about their particular projects. And uh, we begin in a few minutes here with Keith Rogel, who's developing a multi-story uh, downtown um, project. Uh, Larry Florin, who is the CEO of Burbank Housing, the largest affordable housing developer in our area. And he's got some exciting projects to talk about. And then finally, Pauline Block from Cornerstone, and I'll introduce them in more detail, uh, which also has a couple of very exciting uh, multi-story projects in downtown Santa Rosa. So let's begin. Uh, and, and by the way, we'll be uh, time for questions after each speaker. So uh, uh, use the Q&A uh, uh, button on your bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to your, to your questions. So again, our first speaker is Keith Rogel. He is the founder and general partner in Rogel Wash Mole in Napa. His real estate career has been focused for more than 30 years on the redevelopment of obsolete land and buildings into environmentally responsible residential, hospitality, and community projects. He has collaborated uh, with both private and public sector partners. Uh, Keith's projects have been widely recognized for their design and planning excellence, including uh, the receipt of a charter award from the Congress of New Urbanism and several national uh, honor awards from the American Institute of Architects. Uh, much of Keith's work has been in the North Bay, including the development of the Carneros Resort in Napa, 27 acre project that uh, involved 150 buildings in the new urban village uh, for the Napa pipe site in Napa which is development of uh, 160 acres, 1,000 residential units, and, and much other. So we're very lucky to have Keith with us. So please welcome Keith Rogel. Uh, good morning. Th thank you, Brad. Uh, I know we're gonna hear today uh, from Pauline and Larry about some terrific projects uh, that are exciting. And I'm gonna touch on one that we have starting in uh, downtown Santa Rosa. But I thought perhaps it would be useful to just reflect a little more broadly on the kind of issues I know we've all been thinking about and talking about in this extraordinarily chaotic and, and challenging past year and, and share at least our perspective uh, from having been in the market. I realize it's been 25 years since I first began working on opportunities in the, in the North Bay. Um, and I, I've been uh, bullish on that market and committed to it since then. We uh, clearly, sorry, I've lost the video. There we are. We clearly have uh, major challenges, daunting challenges that confront us now. But at the same time, we in this region who are involved in development investment in design and engineering and planning and management, 
in the public and nonprofit, as well as the for-profit sectors, we have superb opportunities before us. I don't think in these past 25 years, I've seen a better time in terms of alignment of the fundamentals of what this region has to offer and what the public needs and wants in the, in the coming years. And I recognize this may seem a bit incongruous coming at the end of a year with an extraordinary amount of widespread hardship in the realm of public health, throughout the small business sector in particular, among enormous numbers of persons with low or modest incomes, and certainly among all those who've suffered by the impacts of these terrible wildfires. So in no way would I wish my remarks to suggest I'm downplaying those hardships, which continue, which are ongoing for many. But what I am saying, what I believe, is that the North Bay's existing resources afford us the potential to attain healthy, sustainable, responsible and rewarding local economic growth in spite of, and in some cases because of, the current macro challenges, if we respond correctly. So why do I say this? What are the elements? Well, COVID, obviously, even once it's been tamed and it no longer poses an inordinate risk, health risk to congregate in offices, it seems very likely that work from home will remain substantially higher than before. The major urban office cores will require less five day per week in commuting and the quick turnaround business travel via air will likely be reduced. All these because of the demonstrated capabilities of being reasonably efficient, not optimal, but effective via video conference. So the number of working people who are compelled to make their primary residence in the bigger cities seem likely to go down for the obvious reasons, too expensive, too difficult to have the space people need, too crowded, too noisy. And as folks have more choice, it seems likely the North Bay would be appealing. Places that were too far before, uh, but become viable locations with less frequent journey to work. A more speculative bet, but one we also believe in is that the same will prove true for some amount of new office location. That the high costs, the bureaucratic delays of opening new business especially smaller startups in the big cities will become more of a deterrent to those locations and more of an inducement to smaller cities within the region if they open their doors and continue to make them business friendly. Um, in, in some ways, it's a later version of the same forces that drove the exceptional popularity of Marin, the beautiful landscape, the outdoor recreation, small town, small city urban experiences, manageable proximity to job centers, but Marin clearly is now a victim of its own success. It's pinned down uh, by vested well-to-do existing stakeholders who feel too much change has already occurred. And there's no fiscal or personal incentive for further growth generally. The result is new developments exceptionally difficult. It's been so for a long time. There's a huge supply demand imbalance and soaring prices. And legitimately large areas are off limits due to topography or habitat or open space. The result's been a pressure buildup that Sonoma or Napa County couldn't really address because of the journey to work impediments. Too far away, too long a journey, worse by lack of transit options, but ferry service was absolutely booming through Vallejo pre-COVID. It'll be back once we can feel safe again in terms of the virus and rail has the chance to grow in traffic and good old fashioned private car transport will be easier with less overall peak hour traffic and fewer trips per week. So all that I think is very good news for the North Bay, which obviously has its own landscape, open space, outdoor recreations, the equal of Marin, and its own authentic small centers with a distinctive character, more influenced by the farming industry and the farming present of the region. So there's an opportunity which has come to the North Bay, I think in a stronger way now than ever, to accommodate new business and new residents, some of whom will be part-time commuters, some who will work from home entirely or in shared workspace, and some who will create new employment altogether within the region, if given the chance. But that's only if we can overcome some other challenges, some old, some new, which have made it hard to keep pace in the past. Now, one research, one uh, enormous change has been this tremendous increase in wildflowers with wildflowers, if only they were wildflowers, wildfires, uh, which have uh, been devastating in terms of the direct impact the loss of life, property, of habitat, the kind of fear and dread and the economic loss. And they're going to recur. And there are also material additional risks, indirect risks, as we began seeing. 
which could be financially very damaging. The potential withdrawal of lenders or investors from our region, just as some of the larger ones were beginning to put their toe in the water. So there are massive changes needed in forest management and development at the wildland urban interface in building practices and ideally in climate trends. But even with all those long, longer term statewide national and international efforts that are needed that are just starting to get the long overdue focus, there is in our local power, the ability to concentrate new housing, new development into existing vacant or to be redeveloped urbanized core sites in every city in the North Bay in locations that have dramatically less fire risk and can be better hardened. And in our direct experience over these past two years, that focus, that narrative has the ability to address at least the present level of invest investor and lender concern. By focusing development in that way, we've been able to, to overcome and we believe our North Bay communities and our partners in general will be able to overcome those negative ratings by the financial community. The NIMBY issue is one we all know and uh, have spent a lot of our time dealing with. Uh, some of you have heard me say in the past, when we as a community chose not to impose a commercial prohibition, a no new business ordinance preventing startups or new hires, and when we neglected to put in place that one child per household policy that was tried elsewhere, you know, we actually lost our chance to be a no growth community. Sonoma County, Napa County, they're not actually no growth. They are strong growth counties, communities. And the question is simply, how do we manage the growth? And for many years, consciously or not, the arduous process in entitlement has meant that growth has been managed by simply exporting our young people, keeping out large numbers of locally employed people. And there've been tremendous adverse consequences, increase in traffic, increase in carbon emissions, decline in community engagement. Well. The consequence, the urban core infill sites have the best chance to get past that log jam. And there's been huge progress in the past couple of years made by public officials at the state and local in leveraging that and recognizing that. Changes in state planning and zoning law related to CEQA, a focus that's occurred and we can speak about it if there are specific questions in terms of uh, certainly the city of Santa Rosa where I've been been concentrating. There's an abundance of parking lots and obsolete older commercial buildings uh, that can be densified, unlike in the core San Francisco, Oakland area, without disrupting or disturbing existing residential neighborhoods. And I think it's really notable that there's substantial fiscal benefit to this compared to the greenfield. There's more bang for our taxpayer buck. The same fixed and human capital infrastructure that's already in place can serve far more residents with school pickups, with police patrols, both the human capital and the fixed capital, they're all easier and less manpower intensive in these infill sites. The increased densities better support the retail activity. Um, that has the benefit for sales tax impact and general livability benefits to the residents. And, and, I, and I should comment that that efficiency then makes it possible for jurisdictions to consider a wide range of fee reductions and fee waivers which in turn make the development more feasible. It's been very exciting seeing elected officials in our region really showing more confidence, more creativity, and more commitment to supporting this kind of work. Now, one could ask if there are all these benefits, why do we really need the public sector meaningful support there? Well, notwithstanding the benefits, there are two substantial hurdles to overcome. One, the construction cost challenges are really material. There's obviously a density benefit, benefit where you amortize your land cost over a larger number of units with a taller, denser building. But for now, the costs of mid-rise construction are driven by the limited market of firms building in that housing type, mostly in the major urban cores where rents are dramatically higher. And the rents are simply not high enough to readily support those costs in our markets. But the pro forma can be greatly enhanced by reducing entitlement risk and shorter pre-development period, which lower the cost of the invested capital by lower municipal fees. And if the investment horizon can be sufficiently long-term by the opportunity zone benefits. A market demand, bankers and investors and sometimes city officials wanna be reassured that there'll be adequate demand. And they'd like to see examples of the comps whereby one can point at previously developed projects in the same market some project that was a great success and it's essentially identical to what was proposed. 
it's a reasonable methodology. It wasn't feasible for, for me when we brought Carneros in forth. It wasn't possible with the kind of urban village we were wanting to create in Napa. And it obviously isn't possible for those of us uh, who are working in downtown Santa Rosa with mid-rise multifamily projects. So there are lots of folks who've been pushing at it for quite a while. There are a number of projects ready to come forward. We can simply look to population demographics to other perhaps analogous market areas to social trends and ultimately to an intuition on how those factors triangulate. And in getting over the line with construction lenders and with the, with the ultimately the residents, any public sector support, both financial and, and kind of communications uh, are very, very positive to shift these from go to, from no go decisions to go decisions. So let me, a lot of generalities. Um, let me just uh, now shift gears and uh, I'll ask Tiana to put up, um, I see the slides there and maybe we can make those, um, pull those up larger. And I'll talk about our first uh, project in Santa Rosa, an apartment development, which has just recently been approved. And um, give a little overview of how we thought about the site and uh, where we are now in the process. So it's a pretty unprepossessing. Uh, we didn't purposely choose such a dreary day, but that's just how it came out. One Santa Rosa Avenue is on the corner of um, Santa Rosa and Third. And um, we uh, acquired that, um, uh, acquired control of that about a year ago. We looked at a number of opportunities in downtown Santa Rosa. And um, as we were updated on the new resilient city ordinances and the general spirit in the city's leadership, we really became believers. Um, the civic commitment in reassembling Courthouse Square long running effort was very impressive. And everyone we met at city staff or on the council was striking in their clarity and their unity in support and a commitment to action. So we looked at a lot of sites having become believers about the, the commitment of the city. By the way, I should just note, speaking of the Brad and the business journal that I first began looking in this region and then Santa Rosa and around as a result of conversations that happened with some public officials, probably about a decade ago, after one of these uh, one of these conferences, where we were working on Napa Pipe, they were talking about their goals. We remain still concentrated in Napa, but stayed with our eyes open on Santa Rosa, and things have just clearly come together. The, as I say, council and staff have have committed themselves in a, in a striking way. So we. As soon as we looked, we said, now is the time. We looked at a number of sites. Um, as we reviewed them, and in fact, we took control of a few, but this one in particular uh, really stood out. And so in partnership with the property owner, who long ago had the vision, uh, the foresight to acquire it for redevelopment and hold it with an eye for that purpose, we've, we've moved that forward. We felt if we were gonna be among the first to develop this different type of housing in, in downtown, it was important to do so in a way that was really prominent, that would be easy for prospective residents and for visitors, for future residents um, to, to see it, to know where it is, to know where they're pointed out to their friends and that it would kind of signal to other developers and investors and bankers that meaningful and high quality residential development was right here, right downtown on the square um, on the, and essentially to say, come on in, the water is fine. There's a wonderful, the work of the square itself, the work that Mr. Futrell has done and, uh, and uh, Sperkowitz in bringing forward the, the hotel. Um, and we thought this site, uh, just its location would be, would be striking. So when we go to the next slide, um, uh, we, we lined up a number of sites. Uh, I'll just make this uh, note that the city laid out the process with great clarity. Um, and the essential issue was a design review to which was fundamental for us that we felt that our project and others like it are setting a kind of new datum for what development is in the, in the core, at the next round of development. And so the important thing was to go back to what we had in the beginning 
in this uh, in this community and uh, what its armor, what its framework was. And we felt strongly that uh, there were very appealing elements: the street and park infrastructure, the scale and character. Of those were were already in place, as if really for a much more substantial place, much more substantial activity than there is now. And I, I imagine it's because it was a real center of commerce, still is, but there was probably a great deal more retail foot traffic and horse traffic 100 years ago. And the streets have been proportioned for that. The parks have built out and those have been, those framework have been maintained. Uh, we wanted to res both respect it and draw from the, the specific distinctive presence of Santa Rosa. And so these are buildings around the square. Um, the top left is on the, um, is basically our site is to the right. This is looking uh, away from the square with the square behind you. To the right, of course, you see what's now the hotel. Um, uh, the lower left is a building that was across the street and on the bottom right uh, is the Rosenberg building. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so there was, as you saw in the earlier pictures, there was a, a clear grid. There was a kind of neoclassical basic format, tripartite buildings, a base, a shaft, a capital or top that was a cornice that was clear. Then there was a kind of uh, free for all, not just in Santa Rosa, but everywhere architecturally. Buildings that have their own individual character, but really um, have no sense of, of unity or connectedness. Uh, that uh, was obviously not something we wanted to embrace, but but let's go to the next slide. We did want to acknowledge uh, to respect the fact that modernity has come. This isn't a uh, hundred years ago. Um, and there were two buildings that were particularly inspirational to us in that regard, uh, or three, I should say. The, the lower left in terms of the Rosenberg building, a kind of bridge to the past, um, a building we think is, very handsome and very well uh, executed and anchors the square well. Uh, but uh, on the upper left, you know, a monolith that was transformed with uh, elegant and creative reskinning and, and transformation, uh, showing a, a modern a modern face. And we wanted to respect that in the kind of color and formality and simplicity of our building. Uh, and we also took some cues from a building that doesn't exist anymore, it's, uh, but it was on the square, which we thought also had beautiful marble and contemporary materials, kind of a Bauhaus building, uh, which showed Santa Rosa beginning to embrace modernity. And so uh, the lower right, uh, we'll go to some more pictures and see what we've, uh, what we've come up with. So next slide, please. So uh, again, the idea was to uh, from the construction cost perspective, to take advantage of the five over two that most of you know about, the, the ability to have a five stories of wood frame on top of a two story concrete podium, uh, but to remain under a high rise, the cost prohibitive level of high rise. So it's a 75 foot building, which complements, we think, well, uh, the adjacent building. Um, we wanted to signal the importance of the square, this corner on the square. Um, and, and to give it, again, a, a kind of simplicity, we elected not to have uh, visible uh, balconies, Juliet balconies, things like that, which can be very nice on quieter streets. But here we felt there was an elegance and a need to not, uh, in a way, not draw too much attention, to, to have it be a, be a backdrop, be more sculptural, and yet to draw people with these balconies in the corner. And you can see on the seventh floor, a full wraparound balcony um, to draw people to the view of the square. Uh, and in many ways we drew from building some of the most really elegant and expensive apartment buildings in San Francisco and New York, this kind of simplicity uh, with the focus to try to still connect to the modernity of the adjacent building. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the second street side, the transit mall um, to have, uh, to have a cafe, something with also an open a window and service both for people who are coming and going there, but also the large number of employees, city and county and state employees who are down on that side, a quick kind of grab and go. Um, to enliven, in the next slide, please. To enliven this, the streetscape 
in a, in a softer way, there's a great deal of retail vacancy. We think Fourth Street is obviously, uh, I mean, it, it's not our thought. It's obviously the manifestly clear that Fourth Street is the retail center and, and everything is struggling right now. They're doing a great job to try to keep going. Uh, we did not feel that this was the place to try to put a, a bunch more retail that we felt would likely struggle, but we also wanted to humanize the street and the scale. And so that was the idea of this intense planting alongside the edge of the building and also giving a few residents direct access, front stoops and direct access onto the street again to, to have people sort of claim that more as, as, their, as their own and, and activate it further in that way. Next slide, please. Uh, just an elevation, giving a sense of that's actually from the transit mall the transit mall side, that space to the far left, the wood panel, that's where we have a, the bike room. There'll be, I think it's 85 bikes in storage there. We made a significant decision not to build parking in the building to try to really encourage uh, the maximum walking and biking. Obviously people need cars, but there's a city parking garage already paid for long ago uh, that has uh, on its busiest day, more than 300 vacant spaces. And so we uh, have worked to arrange um, the ability for our residents to rent spaces there to simply walk across the street. But we hope that to a large degree, they'll also bike, they'll use transit um, in the region. We wanted to animate this side of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, the roof deck, the views are fantastic to the mountains out over the square. And uh, we've put a significant, made a significant commitment uh, to this in landscape. This isn't the greatest rendering, but there'll be a number of different little zones so people can sit privately, they can work, uh, they can relax, uh, enjoy the views or, or have events. Uh, and you get a glimpse of the whole seventh floor, which are all balcony units. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the ground floor plan and you can see the big green area uh, is a courtyard the adjacent building doesn't run all the way back. So uh, to, the, to the left of this drawing, natural light comes up from Second Street, enters that, enters that courtyard. So if some units face that courtyard, open out into little private patios, people can come and go, enter the building that way, residents can uh, as well. You get a sense of the cafe in the lower left and a, a soaring entry, a two-story entry will have a significant piece of public art there to really celebrate that this is a prominent location on the square. Next slide, please. Uh, just a typical floor. Uh, it's a mix um, of studios, ones and two bedrooms. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the seventh floor where these kind of premium units with the, with the balconies, uh, every unit having that balcony. Next slide. Uh, the roof, the roof deck again, the sense of the landscape. Next slide, please. And then, really importantly, in our mind, the, the building in, in context. Simply trying to show that these blocks, that this character uh, of building, can be respectful of its neighbors. Uh, it can be handsome. Uh, there's a, a lot of great cities in the world that have tremendous seven and eight story buildings, blocks and blocks of them that are really form a lovely uh, urban, urban fabric and uh, give a more a stronger presence to the square. The square ultimately feels more of a place as it has more of these kind of walls of an outdoor room around them. Next slide, please. And uh, just a sense of it again from a large review. So, uh, that's the end of my, my slides and I'd love to take any, uh, any questions. Well, thank you, Keith. I, I love the way you think so deeply about these projects. So thank you for, uh, uh choosing Santa Rosa. So, uh, again, you can submit questions, uh, via the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. And, uh, I'll, I'll just start by, um, asking you. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, what what does your demographic research tell you? Who's going to live and be attracted to these to, to, to this kind of living? Yeah, so we we think, and we've had a lot of discussion with uh, facilitated by the Chamber of Commerce and 
uh, and others, but we believe there's a substantial market in terms of people who are working in the area, being recruited to the area, already working in the area at some of the major employers in both tech and, and medical, younger people who would, who would like an urban experience, they're often looking at other cities, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they also really care about the outdoor, the open space kind of benefits of the Bay Area. And so this comp, they don't really want a suburban or garden apartment experience. Uh, Santa Rosa hasn't really had an alternative for them. We, we think that's a meaningful sector, um, but it, the building needs to be, for lack of a better word, cool, attractive. Um, the, what's happened with the, the retailers who are always the, the pioneers has been fantastic in terms of people really raising the bar in terms of the food and wine and beer Mm -hmm. um, and, and street life, but their downtown just needs many, many, many more residents. But I also believe there will be a large number of empty nesters uh, for whom just the stage of life in general, and perhaps all the more so in light of the urban wildland fire issues, mm -hmm. uh, want to stay in their community, want to continue to be part of Santa Rosa, but would like to not worry about maintenance, mm -hmm. not worry about those kind mm -hmm. of risks, uh, but still be able to be in this, in this community. Um, so I, I think it's it's both of those cohorts. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the many many great things about Santa Rosa is you can be in open space in five minutes from downtown. You know, so uh, so I've got a couple of questions here. What are the projected rents for the different types of units? I've got two people asking about that. Thank you. You know, we we're a little too early to pin that down precisely, but we would yeah. expect that if. This is certainly intended to be an upscale market rate project, mm -hmm. although we are going to include, have the inclusionary, very low income mm -hmm. uh, units as well. But we would expect the rents would be similar to the, but with a slight premium to the so-called class A garden apartments. In other words, there hasn't been this product type. Um, so we would expect it is going to, for the audience who's interested in this, it'll take some kind of a premium, at least on a per foot basis, relative to what one might think of as the, the best kind of traditional apartment projects. And the, the premium you're paying is really the, the amenity experience of the building, and, but really you're, you're paying for, for the downtown and for the character. Great, thank you. Thank you. So a uh, question here, we're thanking you for your thoughtful and exciting presentation, because like I say, this is, this is new for us, right? We haven't seen something like this. Uh, we've seen things and uh, proposed, and they just, you know, haven't gotten up off the ground. So here's the question: uh, You mentioned cooperation from the city. How do you, in your experience, rate the city's commitment versus other cities in the region, as well as other states? And what other factors can help your vision of making Santa Rosa the great city it can become? Well, that's a lot. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that was asked because the city of Santa Rosa, uh, they, there was a lot of talk that was talked as we began underwriting and they 100% walked the walk. Everything that was said about how the process would be clear, would be swift, would be efficient, would be fair, would be reasonable. Everything that was presented was implemented. And that is something, having worked in this region for quite a long time and in real estate th for 30 years or so, is extraordinary. And for that, my hat goes off to civic leaders who've been advocating for this for a long time, mm -hmm. but absolutely to the city council. And I think, um, don't know how folks would characterize themselves as left or right on that council necessarily, but, but certainly they're people with divergent views probably generally, but there is absolute unity. It is a like a, a, an eight, eight uh, man rowing shell where everybody on that council is pulling together to make this happen. And that has happened at the staff level as well mm -hmm. in a remarkable way where meetings were held not sequentially, but with all the team coming together, people candidly daylighting what their issues were all at one time rather than the sequential. It is utterly unlike any experience I've ever seen or had uh, yeah. in really in, in 30 years of doing this work, That's, both in New England and here. So hats off. There is still these 
financial challenges are material, the pioneer challenge and the cost challenge. And so everything we can continue to do to work on the fee reductions, for example, water and sewer fees are quite reasonable for the construction of buildings that are in the, uh, that have landscape and meaningful open space. They're much too high for buildings that are urban buildings in terms of their use. So we need to continue to chip away at those things. Um, but I know that there's the focus. Great. Uh, you know, I'm reminded frequently by others that Santa Rosa is the largest city between San Francisco and Portland. And uh, I've never been quite sure exactly what that means, but it does mean something that we are, you know, we have a lot to offer here. And um, if, if we're open to it. Um, uh, last question, how do you finance a project uh, like this? Well, so there's uh, kind of the high risk capital of doing the initial work, which we, you know, as the principles, we speculate mm -hmm. of trying to assess the market and find the site and do the initial studies and then take it through the entitlements. Now, ordinarily that, that amount of capital is enormous. It was tens of millions of dollars at Napa Pipe just for studies and reviews. Um, and so that's very risky mm -hmm. capital. In this case, it was a much, much smaller amount um, and we're able to move pretty quickly to a very, a much more conventional kind of financing, which is people who want to put money into a building that is approved. They yeah. still they have to take risks, the pioneering risk of this yeah. market. The Opportunity Zone helps a bit with that. For lenders, it's going to be a bit of a stretch. Again, it's a new product type. There'll have to be a lot of work in terms of making the market case and showing the employment. But it becomes a, a kind of much more conventional sort of investment thesis than what ordinarily occurs in, in Northern California. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, Keith, uh, I want to thank you again for being here with us this morning and for that very thoughtful and thorough uh, presentation. And we wish you all the best in this, in this project. And uh, we look forward to, to keeping track of it and seeing it come out of the ground. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And, and I know all the Active participants in North Bay Business Journal is a big part of why something like this is now possible. Great. Well, thank you again, Keith. Thank you. So next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Larry Florin, who is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, and President of Burbank Housing. It's a 39-year-old nonprofit that has developed over 4,500 units of affordable housing and we're shifting from this downtown project to uh, what's what's in the offing for our affordable housing which we, we desperately need of course. Uh, prior to his current position Mr. Florin uh, held prominent positions in the public and private sectors in San Francisco. He worked for the mayoral administrations. His projects included the treasure, uh, conversion of Treasure Island to civilian use the replacement of the Embarcadero Freeway and the conversion of the Presidio from the military to the National Park Service. Wow, those are some big ones. Uh, Mr. Florham was the executive director of the Treasure Island Development Authority, an agency that was created to manage the development of Treasure Island. And he was deputy director of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency and oversaw the conversion of the former Hunters Point Naval Shipyard to civilian uh, use. And in, after the 19 89 Loma Prieta earthquake, he led, uh, had lead responsibility uh, for working with FEMA on the recovery. And I could go on and on. We're very lucky to have um, Larry with us this morning. So thank you, Larry, again, for being with us. Thanks, Brad, for having me. God, I sound really old hearing all of that. I think that's what that all means. Uh, first, I have to apologize to everybody. I woke up with a head cold this morning. So I have a little, I'm a little fog, a little more foggy than usual. Um, I know I'm often characterized that way. So if I go off script, please just jump in and keep pull me back in. First, um, probably best to talk a little bit about Burbank. I know most of you, if not all of you know who we are, but just as a reminder, um, actually, I wanna correct Brad a little bit. We are actually in our 40th year. We're just finishing our 40th year uh, in existence as a, the, I'll call it the pre preeminent nonprofit affordable housing builder in the North Bay. Um, and we have now built almost 5,000 units of housing um, and currently have almost 3,400 units under 
engine ownership uh, through mostly Sonoma County, but now increasingly in Napa County. Um, so we've become much more of, of a North Bay presence over especially the last three years. And un unusual nowadays for some uh, affordable housing development companies like ourselves, we actually build both for sale and tax credit rental projects. Um, we currently have under construction um, rental projects in um, Napa, excuse me, uh, home ownership projects in Napa and Santa Rosa. We're doing major rehab projects in Sebastopol and Petaluma, and we're about to start construction in Rona Park on an inclusionary housing, 36 unit inclusionary housing project. We've also got lots of projects in our pipeline right now, pretty exciting ones, including the Sinead uh, project, which we're doing in partnership with Catholic Charities downtown. Santa Rosa, and it'll be a permanent, much, much, much needed permanent supportive housing project. So as you can tell, we have a lot going on. I wanna reach out and really thank our partners, um, especially Mid-State Construction that has worked with us now in a number of projects through what, as you can only imagine, has been some incredibly trying times in the last eight months or so. Um, we have continued, uh, fortunately, um, right from the beginning, uh, the governor declared that affordable housing was an essential service. We agreed with him and we thanked him for that. And so what that has meant is two things. One is that we um, have continued construction throughout this period um, and the projects we had underway, we haven't lost a step. And again, I do wanna thank Mid-State for performing extraordinarily well. Uh, we've also had precision construction that's worked with us in rehabs and did, did very work well under pretty trying circumstances. So they're really, really important partners of ours. And I just wanted to reach out and thank them during this time. I also wanted to thank our staff. Um, so one of the things Burbank is not just an affordable housing development company as a local nonprofit. We also see our mission as being able to provide support and help to our residents, many of whom were disproportionately affected by the pandemic and the closures and everything associated with that. And so we really have felt that our mission is not just to provide safe housing, but also to seek opportunities for our residents to be able to achieve economic stability or during this difficult time. And so our small but, but, but strong resident services staff led by Lauren Taylor has really jumped in and been working with many of our residents to ensure the fact that they're able to pay rent on time that they're able to uh, really mostly that they're able to, uh, if they've lost their jobs to direct them to services um, that, that are out there and to help walk them through. So it's been an incredibly valuable, it's been incredibly tiresome, but it's also been an incredibly valuable experience just to see how important it is to provide this um, full range of services. And I have a renewed and services groups that's worked overtime with, with our residents Nonetheless, it's been incredibly trying, but um, we are, as I said, continuing to move forward. Um, our maintenance folks um, are going into units and doing repairs. And like I said, our construction is continuing. So today I really wanted to focus um, my time on a project that just by sheer coincidence is coming before the Santa Rosa Planning Commission after about two and a half years of work on um, for hopefully the single hearing to approve uh, before the Planning Commission and then ultimately to the uh, Santa Rosa City Council in December. So if any of you are so inclined after this to write a letter of support or call in and provide public comment and only in support, no, just kidding, um, then more than welcome to do that at the Thursday Santa Rosa Planning Commission meeting that starts at four o'clock. And this is um, the project that is listed here is 3575 Mendocino Avenue Redevelopment Project, otherwise former journeys and mobile home park. Um, and if you could advance the slides one, if I could ask. Perfect. Um, so I think many, most of you uh, remember one of the iconic symbols or visuals, excuse me, of the 2017 North Bay fire, particularly the Tubbs fire, was the destruction that occurred at the former uh, journeys and mobile home park. 162 mobile homes, 100 and blanking on the number, I think it was 117 or 114 of them were fully destroyed. A uh, uh, number of people were uh, unfortunately caught in the fires and, and did die in the fires. And 44 of the units, as you see on this picture, 
uh, that before you were left standing, but could not be occupied because of the damage and destruction to the infrastructure that was here. So just soon after um, we toured the sites, um, our new co-development director, Efren Carrillo, who many of you remember is former supervisor, um, Mr. Carrillo, um, we toured the site with then supervisor James Gore and immediately we felt as though Burbank, if we were going to play a productive role in the rebuilding and recovery of the North Bay, if this was an incredibly unique and, and rare opportunity for us to be able to do that. So we worked out an agreement with the uh, owners of the park. Very interesting, a family has owned this uh, site. It's 13 acres. Um, I think many of you are probably familiar with it next to immediately adjacent to Kaiser, um, right off of 101 and Mendocino Avenue. Um, and um, it's been in his family since the 1950s. And it was actually, I found out during the process called the Journey's End mobile home park because at the time this was outside the city limits of Santa Rosa. And you literally, it was the last lights that you saw before you hit, um, I think it would have been Healdsburg, I wasn't here um, at the time, but, um, and so it was literally, it was the end of the journey. So that's how it, it got its name. But it had been predominantly um, senior occupied. Um, many of the individuals who were in the park um, were on social security, on fixed incomes. And so any project that would go to replace the mobile home park, we really, really felt strong, had to speak to the needs of the 162 residents that were part of the park uh, before it was destroyed. So we, um, after working on an agreement, on a, essentially an option and a long-term lease on the property, a 95 year lease on the property with the property owner, set about to go through what was an arduous task of a process of trying to get the site ready for redevelopment and now through the approvals and then the next step, which is financing, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit into, into the presentation. Um, we did seek a partner, um, a group that I was very familiar with from some of my previous roles that uh, Brad mentioned, and it was uh, related of California, which is a very large uh, for-profit uh, affordable housing development company. And it's a little rare for us to do that to uh, enter into a partnership with a for-profit, but it's really based on the capacity of our organization and realizing we didn't, we wanted to see this get built. And if partnering was a better way to ensure that then we were gonna do that, but also to, to partner with a company of like mind that really would be concerned primarily about the uh, fate of the residents and making sure they were taken care of. And, related is that kind of company. And so we're definitely excited to be in partnership with them on this particular project. Um, it'll provide housing for lower income seniors, uh, the project when it's ultimately built, uh, people 55 um, years of age and, and above and annual and median incomes of 30 to 60% um, to the um, of, of rents that are beyond the property. Most, when, just well, one of the most important aspects of this, and we did get a waiver from the state of California, um, given our funding sources, which um, I'm gonna go into later, that they, we would be able to um, uh, offer first uh, occupancy on the site to residents, to former residents of the mobile home park who might have uh, lost their homes and or um, yeah, would have lost their mobile homes at that point. Can I go to the next slide. So here is um, what is actually before the Planning Commission on Thursday, which is the project itself. Um, there are two components of the project. We are master planning the entire 13 acres um, and um, then will consist of a market rate uh, component, which we are not gonna be developing since Burbank is strictly in the affordable housing business um, and the affordable housing piece, which as I mentioned before, we're developing with um, related of California. All told, um, the project itself will have a higher density than most, and many of the projects that go through the process, especially in this area of Santa Rosa, 40 dwelling units to the acre. Um, there'll be up to 532 um, multifamily rental units. As I mentioned, 162 of those will be senior affordable units that Burbank and related are developing and up to 370 market rate units that will be approved on the site. Um, also, there's some of the amenities that, you know, there'll be a play area, a dog park, sports court, 
port, excuse me, and just recreation areas. Um, and um, one of the important discussions, especially given the history of the site, was to ensure that there was an evacuation plan that we were, were understanding what occurred um, in 2017 and took all precautions that we could to make sure that if, um, if some, something happened as in the site or in this vicinity um, in the future that there would be adequate access. So ingress and egress, a fire evacuation plan was actually part of the approval process that we submitted to the, um, that we um, submitted to the city. Um, we're also, um, as with Keith, we're, while we're not eliminating parking, we're reducing some of the parking and, and providing alternative transportation modes. Um, uh, we're proposing a 25% parking reduction, but accommodating more bicycle spaces, for instance, on the site. So this is what's actually before the Planning Commission on Thursday. Um, it would be the certification of, um, it's called, it's a new document, it's something called the Sustainable Communities Environmental Report, uh, long bureaucratic name, and it's really an EIR, but in a condensed form, um, general plan amendment, zoning amendment, and the like, and then a subdivision map eventually would follow. So do we, next slide. So come, some of the principles in developing the project, um, we have been incredibly fortunate with public, excuse me, with, um, Nonprofit, other nonprofit and uh, for profits that have come forward and provided financial support for this project up to the to get us to this point. And one of our partners was a group called Enterprise Community Partners. Um, they're a what's called a community development financial institution, um, and they were tasked by Kaiser uh, nationally to administer a fund um, that would uh, that would uh, invest in affordable housing. And one of the components of that fund was any project that moved forward had to complete a, a health, um, health action plan, excuse me, that would be integrated into the development of the project. And so we're in the process of completing that health action plan and it's going to inform things that we do on site like the recreation areas, the types of materials we use, um, the way generally the project is built. Um, and it'll build, be built to the highest levels of sustainability. And as I mentioned before, resiliency in regards to the principles of uh, making sure that uh, we respond to what happened on the site. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, here is a, just a general uh, statement about the market rate uh, portion of the project, 370 market rate rental units um, on 9.25 acres. Um, it's got transit village, Transit Village Residential Development Standards, um, multiple buildings for three to four story buildings, um, and a mix of studios, one, two, and three bedroom of, uh, units, um, and a total of 605 parking spaces. Um, as I mentioned, there is not currently in contract a market rate developer for that portion of the site. Um, once the project is entitled and subdivided, the um, project uh, landowner, um, you know, a gentleman by the name of Ramsey Shueto is in, in process of trying to identify market rate partners. That will go on a separate path from the affordable part of it, which I'm gonna get into in a second. Um, and it'll be spun off once we, once we subdivide the property. Um, next, part, next slide, please. Um, and here's the affordable senior project. It is the, uh, I guess it's the bottom of the screen. Um, the southernmost portion of the site, I don't have a point or anything, but it's the buildings, it's probably the most developed. So when we go in for approvals on the project, we're actually getting project levels approvals um, on, on that part of the site. Um, it's a two and a half acre parcel. Um, it's got a central park, have transit obviously adjacent to medical services at Kaiser. Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, It'll have um, one and two bedroom units, mostly about 530 to 800 square feet um, and um, multi-purpose room, health and wellness room, et cetera. Um, as with all of these affordable projects, um, they'll be affordable for a 55 year term. Um, the intent is to continue them to perpetuity, but there'll be deed restrictions on the property that ensure that the rents on the property remain affordable. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the financing of this because that's the next stage. Obviously, after we get our approvals, uh, we hope and we assume next month um, and with all your support, I'm sure that'll happen. 
Um, it takes, a, a, to build affordable housing, it takes an extraordinary number of sources to be able to help underwrite the costs of, of development, especially given the cost of construction these days. So um, we were incredibly fortunate. I'm gonna start first with the grants on the right side of the project. And this is really how we got going on the project. Um, the Kaiser Foundation, um, in deference to the fact that the residents of this park in part helped to save the Kaiser Medical Center, uh, gave us a significant grant that was, su that was sufficient for us to underwrite and to pay for all of the costs associated with the entitlement, with getting the master plan approved through the city of Santa Rosa. Incredibly generous and we really, really appreciate their support. Um, the Tipping Point Foundation, which is a San Francisco based foundation that you may have heard from a couple of years ago. They got active in the North Bay right after the fires to help bring resources. Um, they helped with a grant for, and that grant went to help pay the relocation costs of the former residents. And so we actually entered into agreements with all of the former residents of the uh, park that were, um, all of the former residents, including some, in some cases, their heirs, unfortunately. But um, to, uh, to, to, that was, and that was about a two year and a half process to enter into those agreements, get them verified, and then to officially close the park, and change, in a, which we needed to do before we changed the use out there. The Sonoma County Community Foundation was helpful in providing assistance for the former residents to ensure that they were. So it really took the entire community coming together to first, and this was really important to Burbank, to make sure that the residents were taken care of um, as we move forward with this project. That is part of our mission, and that was really, really important. And we couldn't have done that part of it, especially without the support of the entire community. Next, please. Um, so that's the, that's the last slide on that project. Um, we, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. Go back one slide. I, I completely missed the last slide. So that was the, that was the grand side of the project. Um, the financing part of the affordable senior project, I wanted to get into for a second because I think it's really important. I'm just gonna spend a second doing that, Brad. I know probably coming up against my time, but um, the, uh, Congressman Thompson last year was able to get inserted into, uh, I guess what you sort of euphemistically call the budget reconciliation bill that went through in December 2019, a one-time allocation of low-income housing tax credits for disaster relief for the 2017 and 2018 fires. And what that did was brought one-time funding of $100 million of 9% low-income housing tax credits to communities, 13 counties all told, that were impacted by the disaster. That was um, $100 million for any of you that are nuanced in the world of tax credits, corresponds virtually to about a billion dollars in new equity that came into the state of California. And I really want to applaud Congressman Thompson who, who made that happen. Um, there was a competition for those credits that was conducted by the Tax Credit Allocation Committee under the Treasurer's Office. Five projects actually in the Santa Rosa and slash Sonoma County were awarded um, credits under that competition. One of them was our project we're doing in downtown Santa Rosa, the Caritas Village project, which was permanent supportive housing. The Journey's End project was then put onto a waiting list and they just published the waiting list last week and the Journey's End project is the number one on the waiting list and there will be additional credits that will be coming out of the project. So a long way of saying, we're anticipating that we'll have these 9% disaster credits that'll help offset a lot of the costs. There's also the city of Santa Rosa is in the process of conducting a notice of funding availability for another source of funding that again, Congressman Thompson was critically important in getting us for us. And that was disaster relief, otherwise known as the CDBG DR. Um, that process is underway now and um, project-based vouchers, which so basically it's section eight uh, uh, vouchers or what used to be called, they're now called housing choice vouchers um, that are applied to units and you're able to sell debt on that. And then there's traditional debt. Those are the four layers that we're looking at right now. With those, we believe we uh, would be able to um, move towards construction um, in the fall of 2021. 
um, and we are moving forward full speed ahead on design construction drawings to get in the ground by then. Um, with that, Brad, I think I'll take a pause and see if there are questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Larry. What, a, what an incredible project and we wish you the best with it. Um, I might start off again, if you wanna ask a question to Larry, uh, there's a and a button at the bottom of your screen, if you would use that, uh, Larry, but let me start off in our planning call. You mentioned there were some other public financing resources uh, kind of loosening up uh, for uh, the region. Um, yeah, well, the first of the disaster relief monies that I mentioned, which are the community development block grant disaster relief funding, it's been a very difficult process. Let's say it was allocated for over two years ago. And um, a group of us that went to the, uh, Washington, DC, um, especially call out Henry Hansel and Michael Mondavi, um, Darius Anderson, um, were helpful, were really critical in being able to get those funds allocated for the disasters um, under the guidance, by the way, of the Rebuild Norway Foundation. But those were uh, allocated almost two years ago. And then the state of California took an extraordinarily long time to get that out on the street. The good news is it's now out. Okay. Um, it took two and a half years, but it's there. Um, and so we're gonna work through that process. So that those funds are really, frankly, a one-time shot in the arm um, that will really, I think, make a really big difference in the number of affordable units that get built. Great. Um, so so what, what kind of scale are we talking about? The hundreds of millions or? Well, so the, so the, um, the CDBGGR is for 30, I believe it was 36 million, um, mm -hmm. or the NOFA is about $36 million. But a lot of that is gap financing. So okay. the idea being that you, you, you include that with other, your other financing sources, whether it be tax credits, 12% yep. or 9% credits. So it has a catalyst, um, it, it just, it grows exponentially. Yeah. This is so often you mentioned that gap financing, these projects, you know, can get very close to the finish line, but you can't right. get them there. And that gap financing is really important. Uh, one last question here uh, from our audience. Uh, what proportion of the projects Burbank intends to develop are transit oriented, say, i.e. smart? All of it. It's the basic principles of this. In fact, our zoning designation is transit oriented development. So for everything, you know, there's not a huge number of transit opportunities, but there are enough. And so, like I said, we're limiting the number of parking spaces. We're increasing the number of bike bike spaces. Um, we are uh, helping, we are providing opportunities for bus transit onto the site. So, and it's given its location, it's really, um, really well centered for, you know, access to SMART. And so it is a principle behind which we've designed and planned this project. Right. Well, thank you again, Larry, for being with us and for your work on behalf of our communities. Uh, we thank you for being here this morning and thank you for your work. Good luck with the, uh, the the Planning Commission meeting on Thursday. We'll all Thank be you. About you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So our, our final speaker here this morning, again, very exciting point that we're at. I like the way Keith started us off saying instead of no go, we're kind of in a go phase. Uh, it's Pauline Glock. She's a Sonoma County local, self-described. She graduated with her bachelor's degree in business from Chico State and moved back to Sonoma County to complete her MBA at Sonoma State University. Pauline runs the marketing and development uh, efforts for the local commercial property owner and developer Cornerstone. Her current work is focused on building uh, housing in downtown Santa Rosa that incorporates affordable by design units, sustainable building methods, and much needed community amenities such as childcare. Boy, don't we need that right now. So Pauline uh, lives with her husband and two young children in Santa Rosa. Welcome, Pauline. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction, Brad, and thanks for having uh, me today. I'm really encouraged by the other speakers that I'm hearing and uh, also really excited to share with you all what Cornerstone is working on. Um, so as Brad mentioned, we are a commercial property owner here in the North Bay. We have about 30 or so commercial properties from as far north as the Santa Rosa Airport um, to down to the Redwood Business Park in Petaluma. Um, and then we also have a handful of sites uh, in downtown Santa Rosa, which is where we are focusing our efforts for the uh, mixed use residential projects. Um, so we really understand that there's a need to create a range of housing opportunities. Um, our first two transit oriented urban infill projects um, are designed to target workforce housing. Um, this 
term can be thrown around a lot uh, and there's many different meanings for it. But when I talk about workforce housing, I'm really referring to that missing middle here in Santa Rosa. So what we're seeing is that can be anywhere between the 80 to 120% area medium income all the way up sometimes to the 150% um, because of the rents um, and the housing prices here. So, um, you know, this, this group of people in this missing middle contains a lot of people who hold our community up, um, positions like teachers, nurses, even doctors, fire, police officers. Um, these are really the pillars holding our community up and we're not providing housing that is really something they can afford or options that are available. Um, obviously there's a ton of other positions and a ton of other people in this group as well. Um, so what we're trying to focus on is, is solving that. Um, and finding a place where this 82, like I said, 120 to 150% area median income can, um, who can't currently afford the rents, but can't qualify for affordable housing, have a really solid option. Um, so uh, another really important aspect that I'll touch on a lot and that you'll see as a reoccurring theme for Cornerstone and something we truly believe in is providing amenities that increase um, walkability, accessibility, quality of life, especially living in an urban downtown area. Um, so things that are more service-based amenities, things like Brad mentioned, childcare, which we know is an extremely part, uh, extremely important part of our community and also something that's really struggling right now um, and was even before you know COVID and the fires. Um, things like health clinics, grocery markets. So we take these things into consideration when we're thinking about what's traditionally retail at the ground floor we're taking into consideration what is actually needed and how can we transform it into a space that's more usable um, and we'll add back to the community. So I'll talk about that a little bit too. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, let's just go to, all right. And actually before I start, I do also wanna echo uh, Keith's comments about the city. We um, also have seen, let's see, did that come up? Uh, I hope so. Um, we've also really seen uh, Santa Rosa, the city council and planning staff um, walk the walk, like he said. Uh, they, you know, you. this is witnessed from creating the renewable enterprise district to the newly approved um, updated uh, downtown station specific plan, um, reducing fees. So we really feel strongly that there's great opportunity and this is um, going to be a really good time the next few years to bring these projects forward in our community. Um, so let's jump into the project. I'm not going to go super into detail. Both of the projects I'm talking about today were submitted for concept review. So the city's um, website, the development uh, part of Santa Rosa City website has the full deck of slides if you're interested, but I'm kind of going to keep it high level today. And I'm hoping you can all see my screen because I only see myself. So <laughs> I'm going to go with that for now. Um, uh, so this, Pauline, we're, yeah. we're not seeing your screen right now. I was uh, worried about that. Let's see. Sharing is paused. Oh, maybe I have to stop my video. Hold on. Sorry. Let's try this again. Share screen. It's not doing it, huh? There we go. We're, um, I'm seeing, seeing it, something now. It looks like a, a, a site map. Perfect. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> so the first project I'm going to talk about is uh, 556 Ross Street. This is right on the corner of Mendocino Avenue and Ross Street adjacent to the Press Democrat building. Um, so, and it doesn't want me to move forward. Oh, there we go. All right, so this one we have proposed as an eight story building with 110 units, 10% um, affordable. The mix we proposed is, uh, is affordable by design, studio, one bedroom and two bedroom units. Um, so we, both the projects I'll talk about today, we are looking at the affordable by design concept. So this really means we're just maximizing the space in the units and making it feel really livable, but reducing the square footage. So it's, um, they'll be smaller than typical floor plans in Santa Rosa, um, but therefore the rents will be less just because of that design. So that's what we're really focusing on in these projects. Um, you can see there's a, a terrace there as well on the um, kind of on that uh, eighth floor. Um, we are also proposing with this project to change Ross Street into a really activated and pedestrian friendly street. So right now it's kind of an underutilized, almost like an alley in and out of parking lots. 
Um, and so we feel like if we can bring in elements that really slow or limit through traffic, um, you know, expand spill out spaces from storefronts, provide outdoor seating, then this street really becomes a vibrant, desirable public space um, that can be utilized much more than it is today. And we're working with the city on trying to figure out, you know, how this can become a reality. Here's an idea of what it would feel like as really a more activated um, area. This is, I don't know if any of you have been to like Crook's Coffee down there, or there's, um, there's a few really cool spaces and it's just, you can see it's very underutilized and we feel like it can be such a great asset. Um, another thing that we're looking at in this project is trying out these mechanical stackers um, to actually provide a care uh, car share program for the building. So as Keith mentioned earlier, we, um, I guess this would be technically 0% parked. We have some parking stalls, but they'd be for the car share program. There is a parking garage around the corner on 7th Street that is most of the time 50% or less um, filled. So uh, again, we're doing the same thing, testing out, um, having people not have to rely on cars so much. We're so near to transit in the downtown area. Things are more walkable. If we provide amenities, we feel that it, it can really um, be something that, uh, is here for the future as well, because we are gonna be moving towards that. So um, we have that in this uh, proposal. And we also have this community space where we're looking at adding childcare to the ground floor. And this is something we're working with quite a few organizations in Santa Rosa to figure out how we can create kind of a pilot program and show that this is a sustainable thing to put into um, a mixed use development. Um, so this would be a public uh, facility, not just for the building, um, and, and hopefully that's something we can figure out so that it can be part of additional projects moving forward. I'm going to move on to our project in Railroad Square. So this is 34 6th Street. Um, this is the entire site that you can see on the map along the rail and along 6th and 3rd. I'm going to be focusing on the building, that orange bar that is along 6th Street today. Um, I will touch on the rest of the master plan. So this one's proposed as a six story building with about 110 units as well. The mix is really similar to Ross Street as far as the types, um, but we have a higher two bedroom count um, and reduced micro studios at this site because we really do see families, uh, more families living here. Um, we're also starting to talk about possibly incorporating the artist community into this project um, and just trying to think of innovative ways to include all sectors of our community that, um, that may not have options right now. Um, so here's an idea of the master plan. Again, I'm focusing on that building all the way to the left of the screen, um, but we do have additional phases that include public open areas, um, that uh, extension of 4th Street all the way down to hopefully a future connection to the Santa Rosa Creek Trail, um, creating that multi-use trail along the rail. So that kind of stops um, at each end of the property. So connecting that so it's full and then the back street connecting third and six as well. Um, you can see we have a community pool on site. So that would be something that would be accessible to the adjacent neighborhood with a membership um, uh, to the fitness center that's there as well. And then that outdoor play area that's also accessible. So we really wanna blend into the neighborhood. We don't wanna just build right next to it. So that's our hope with this, that it's really activated and that the communities are, um, the community that's in the building and the community that's in the neighborhood are really actually become one. Um, so let's see. This is an idea too of the ground level. So we did put um, units at the ground floor of this building. We felt like having stoops that come up to, uh, to the doors um, of these units here really felt very much like the neighborhood and that it could be kind of a cohesive transition like I was talking about. Heavily landscaped again, like Keith said about his ground floor units, some similarities there. So this last slide that I'm going to end on, I just wanna talk a little bit more just about Cornerstone's overall vision, what, what we are really trying to do. Um, so we have always looked at our projects with three main goals in mind, community, innovation, and sustainability. Um, so, our goal is that our projects are kind of the intersection of these three things. Um, so for community, we see our projects attracting workforce from Santa Rosa um, or workforce to Santa Rosa from other parts of the Bay Area, um, which will create a really diverse, really activated community, increase the economic vitality of our downtown and our region. 
Um, living in downtown creates a really strong community. When people are close, they have that sense of place, belonging, that really increases quality of life. Um, and that all ties back into how our community interacts. So we really, really want our projects to be that catalyst. And that's why we have so many shared spaces um, within the buildings that aren't just building specific or resident specific. Um, it's because we wanna incorporate the community into it. Um, on innovation, we are definitely focused on technology innovations, but we also look at it on a much wider spectrum. So we're looking at things that are innovative in construction, you know, building systems, um, the car share program I talked about, other reduced parking programs. And um, we look at things that uh, like the unit mix, that, that's more innovative. We don't really, we aren't seeing micro studios and these smaller um, floor, uh, floor plans here um, in Santa Rosa. So all those tie into the innovation side. And then for sustainability, a lot of things I just talked about actually feed into sustainability. Um, on the screen, there's a few of the uh, principles from smart growth, which we really look at and try to apply to our projects. Um, so on sustainability, you know, a lot of the technologies I talked about can drive down greenhouse gas emissions, the pro project's um, overall carbon footprint, um, things like walkability, electrification, solar, sustainable materials, green roofs, all of that um, all play into the sustainability front. Um, the two projects right now are uh, looking like they're about at a lead silver, but possibly um, one of them is leaning more to uh, lead gold. So we're really looking at what we can do to, to move the needle on that. Um, so like I've kind of mentioned, a lot of what we're doing in this is a test um, to see what works here in Santa Rosa and how we can build future developments with this kind of roadmap. Um, and while we keep community innovation sustainability top of mind, we're approaching our projects in a way that can be economically viable so that we can move on to larger projects in the future. Um, so I just want to close with saying that as you can probably see from the projects, um, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen actually. Um, as you can see, we really, uh, we don't look at the building as the building. Um, we look at our projects on a broader kind of master plan. Um, and we think about how is this fitting into our community? How is this fitting into downtown? What do we want for the future of our children here in the North Bay to give them opportunities to stay here? So that's always how we're thinking about the projects. Um, and, and so we're really excited to bring them forward. And I thank you again, Brad, for having us today. Thank you, Pauline. And thank you for uh, your commitment to downtown Santa Rosa and to Santa Rosa in general, including Alana Aldani or at Cornerstone. Uh, let me, let me uh, questions again can be uh, submitted in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Let me start off by asking you, uh, Pauline, what can employers do to help around this whole issue of getting, you know, these projects uh, underway? That's a great question. Um, and we have been speaking to quite a few of the major employers um, who have trouble attracting workforce yeah. or retaining workforce to stay here. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we feel like they are part of the solution and they will be, um, and we're mm -hmm. going back to them. So we've had conversations about, you know, can you, master lease a floor and you know have it available for your staff or for your new recruits um, and this goes to not just tech but you know nurses and um, teachers uh, all of those industries and so we're really trying to create the roadmap uh, this hasn't been something that's really been done so they're not familiar with it um, yes. so we welcome all feedback related to that yes. but it's something that we're looking at doing uh, with the buildings and also with child care because that's another thing yes. that really uh, employers are having a hard time with, especially yeah. now is, yeah. with their employees. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in fact, I heard something from the CEO of a large uh, tech company a couple of days ago that was a little disturbing and that, you know, they've got multiple locations around the world where employees can go and they're starting to get frustrated with the high cost of living here, the wildfires and just say, hey, can I get a transfer to X, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, and so while we're attracting people out of the Bay Area, possibly into our housing market, we've also got this other reality, of high cost and all the other issues we're having. But, um, so, uh, so once again, um, so where, where, where in the process are these two projects? So these were both submitted. We, we went to the design review board um, and actually the, the railroad square site also had the um, cultural heritage board. So we got through those and we are just putting together 
the next step to, to formally submit. That's just amazing. And all of these coming together almost simultaneously. Have you done, um, what's your research on who would be attracted to these kinds of developments? Yeah, um, so we feel like there is opportunity for not, there's the, we feel like the younger people who are moving here want mm -hmm. this urban lifestyle. Yeah. Um, so we definitely have that, you know, people coming to work for um, tech companies or startups mm -hmm. or are even, um, you know, already here and living maybe at home with their parents um, right. and want to get out. Um, but right. then families, I mean, we have some really innovative units um, that are focused on providing more space within the units for families um, mm -hmm. because we, we hope that people aren't, you know, living paycheck to paycheck for their rent. That's really uh, something right. that we see all the time. And yeah. so uh, we do see a huge need for families and, and also roommate situations. It's just gives them more shared space outside of their units to utilize. Yep. Well, listen, thank you again for uh, your investment in our downtown. And thank you for being with us here today. Uh, again, the childcare piece is really key. I think, uh, you know, companies are finding, you know, the childcare is a critical factor in attracting and retaining employees so that they, you know, that they get their child taken care of while they're working. So once again, Pauline, thank you for being here with us this morning. And uh, thank you again. So, Absolutely. thank you. I want to thank uh, our, our sponsors here for. Uh, well, we have three great speakers. I'm going to go back to that. Keith, fantastic, and Larry for your work on the affordable housing front. And and Pauline, thank you again. Again, our sponsors made this possible, free to attendees. So, if you know someone at these companies, send them an email, thank them, give a wave to them. Jolotti Construction Company our underwriter, uh, our major sponsors, George Peterson Insurance Agency, Oles Morrison, a law firm, Wright Contracting, and our corporate sponsors, Marin Builders Association, Mid-State Construction, Norby Construction, and the North Coast Builders Exchange. I might mention quickly on Thursday, 10 o'clock, hour and a half, our CEO briefing with one of the leading uh, investment analysts uh, in the United States. You see her quite frequently, Margaret Reed from Union Bank will give us a, a, a forecast on the economy, which we're all, I'm sure, very, uh, you know, want to know. Uh, and then also a really uh, terrific panel of, of local business leaders, uh, Ron Nersessian from Keysight, uh, Carissa Cruz from uh, the Sonoma County Wine Growers, and finally, uh, Xavier and Kovic from Amy's Kitchen. You're going to hear, it's going to be a tremendous hour and a half, again, free to attendees, we hope you'll join us on Thursday. Thank you again to everyone for being with us. Bye-bye.